going to do a talk on Aboriginal gambling. We're going to go through a little bit of the research we've uh, conducted at Southern Cross University um, of more than 850 Aboriginal people. So I'll share that with you before finishing off with some, some strategies and ideas about moving forward. Um, a little bit of a, an Aboriginal community snapshot uh, for those who don't know a lot about Aboriginal people in, a, in Australia. But again, it represents 2.5% of the Australian population. So that's more than 517,000 people according to the census in 2006. The gross rate is double that of non-Aboriginal population. And New South Wales accounts for 28% of the Indigenous population. And I believe Queensland is about 27%. So most are living on the eastern side. Um, Indigenous people remain the most disadvantaged due to loss of land and consequent poverty, dislocation from culture, identity, social structure and loss of economic independence. <coughs> Preventable diseases remain a major problem in Indigenous communities, particularly remote communities. Uh, these are caused by poverty, poor nutrition and hygiene and are intensified by lack of appropriate and specifically targeted health care. We as a nation, not just Aboriginal people, God, not 19 billion a year anyway, is, is spent on gambling, 12 billion a year spent on poker machines. Uh, the average Australian is spending over $1,100 on, on gambling. So we, we are recognised as a, a, bit of a bit of a country that loves to gamble. So what do Aboriginal people mainly gamble on? Maybe it's similar to other Indigenous populations, but we found that in this research it was predominantly poker machines for, for both sexes, card games, um, horse racing, bingo, sports betting. The, the, the Kino and, and Scratchies and, and the others are all already on the rise, but I would have to mention poker machines in large towns and cities and in remote communities it's card playing. And I can tell you now the federal government is still struggling to understand what we can do in remote communities in regards to card playing, because it is a social activity that's played you know, nearly every day and, and you can see card games being played for two and three and four days at a time. Both male and female like to gamble. We found that poker machines are strong in both, but men particularly like the TAB as well and the sports betting, and the female more or less into bingo and keno and, and games such as those. Um, when people start gambling, they often become problem gamblers. We struggle to stay in recreational safe gambling. Now, is that a priority? Should we be focusing on, on that group? Because I know in comparison to uh, to the other Australian population is their statistics on recreational gambling is so much higher than ours. So we're finding that we need to teach Aboriginal people to remain safe, responsible gamblers because once introduced, it's leading to problem gambling. The research also showed that in comparison to the wider community, um, problem gamblers is, is looked at 2% thereabouts and we know it is approximately between 12 and 15% in this research and we've found that 30% in some remote communities. Uh, Aboriginal people are not seeking help, um, especially from gambling counselling services. So that's a shame considering the results and, and the statistics. Why aren't Aboriginal people putting up their hand and asking for assistance? Um, and obviously the last one there, it, it, we're finding a lot of people uh, finding it hard to admit they might have a gambling problem. Why can't we stay safe recreational gamblers? Um, the biggest one was the learned behaviour. When you see growing up in a community, particularly cards, that's what you've learned. That's just an, an accepted community activity and, and obviously, you know, through our generation, that's how we'd like to learn, like I've said. But others, often unemployed, and that's a risk factor we know as gamblers. Uh, we cannot stay in responsible or safe gambling, like I've mentioned. And the boredom, um, particularly remote communities, uh, there's limited opportunities and activities. Uh, they can always borrow from their family and friends, and that's another cultural factor we need to take into consideration. We know we shouldn't provide a gambler with a safety net, even an alcoholic. Um, I know that I can gamble and then go and ask for someone for money or for food, and we support each other. And so, as a family, as a cultural group, that's not helping the gambler. So why do Aboriginal people gamble? Probably the same. You guys can compare these to the communities you guys are working with. But the most common ones to win money in hope to change their financial situation. Okay? And the second most popular was to escape all right, from problems and reality, to zone out. And the others were to be sociable, excitement, and the learned behaviour, the boredom, and becomes a routine and community accepted. I'll go through some barriers and then I'll get into some strategies, but 
What we've found in the whole community, we're talking about across the board, across the Aboriginal population, there's a lack of understanding of services available in their role. If I ask someone, where would you go if you got to get help? They couldn't tell me. And if they did tell me, I can ask more questions, what do they do there? They wouldn't know what, what happens at that service. Is it free? Do I see a male? Do I see you know, a, a female? Do I stand up in a group? You know? So there's a lot of questions they ask about what the service actually provides. So there's a lot of education around what these services actually do. What is counselling? Aboriginal people couldn't answer that question a lot of the times. Uh, gambling is seen as too sensitive an issue to talk about. As an Aboriginal person, it looks like I'm introducing a new problem to Aboriginal community. So sometimes I'm seen as that, look, let's forget about gambling at the moment. We've got so many other issues to deal with. Gambling isn't a priority here. So it's still seen as a, something not of important, but it's still very sensitive because um, no one wants to hear about it. The lack of confidence in Aboriginal services provide confidentiality. So I find this one very hard because we have Aboriginal medical services, Aboriginal legal aids. Um, often Aboriginal people won't go to those services out of fear of confidentiality, of the sharing of problems and you know, someone else finding out. So we know each other. I know in my community you can go into the Aboriginal Medical Centre and you know people. So if you're going to see a counsellor, more than likely the people waiting in the waiting room will, will know who you are. The model of Indigenous gambling, um, some of you might have seen this before, but we've changed it and tweaked it a bit. But at, if we're looking at the intervention and what we'd like to do, we've got to look at their desire to gamble. So we're looking at their risk factors there, the personal, the background, any historical factors, any cultural factors. We need to look and analyse and, and look into those. If we're looking at our interventions when they come there, how they look at the gambling products and the services, the poker machines or the cards or whatever it might be, we need to look at their access, the design, I know that Aboriginal people love the sounds and the way the, the poker machine works, but when you look at how they're marketed and the consumer appeal to the gambler. And on the other side, they're obviously they're the problems associated with gambling. So we're looking at the risk factors there, how they're being affected personally, financially, family and so forth. And um, those will then dictate the intervention and they'll also dictate the size of the gambling intake. That could be very large or very small. When we're looking at addressing Aboriginal gambling problems, particularly in just Aboriginal communities. I've broken up into communities, I've broken up into um, support services and, and others. So the first one is to raise the community awareness about gambling related issues and local interventions for Aboriginal people. Provide information on local gambling related issues and how they can be addressed. Allow communities to acknowledge that issue which provides ownership. I think historically governments and people have said how what we should be doing. They're telling Aboriginal people what's happening and, and what laws and, and, and what regulations need to be in this community. Where too, too often we need to get to the bottom of the issue, sit down with the community, sit down and have a discussion and see what their concerns are, get them to raise the issue with you and then they'll acknowledge that there's a problem. That gives them ownership and with ownership they'll then give us the direction and support. I never go in the community to tell them what we should be doing. Others encourage the discussion and acknowledgement of gambling and related problems as an important within the Aboriginal community. So we're not doing this. Um, provide information about gambling interventions and available services. Again, they're not aware of the services available. Fac facilitate collaboration between local stakeholders in Aboriginal and mainstream settings. This is about working together. Facilitate cultural awareness discussions and strategies, particularly for Aboriginal people and, work, and trying to understand non-Aboriginal services but also working with non-Aboriginal services and how they can better support Aboriginal people. In regards to gambling health services, we provide information to local gambling services how they can be improved culturally. Okay? How they can be improved culturally. How we can support them on that level. So provide cultural supervision and support to counsellors and, and look at that cultural competency. <laughs>